let's start. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tian Tian, who is uh, a six-year PhD student from uh, the uh, CS department. Uh, he's co-advised by uh, me and Professor Hagel. Um, and Tian came to us I'm excited to see uh, so many advisors, lab mates, mentors, friends, and everyone uh, who are here. And also those who are away but still remember this. A little bit about myself. Uh, I also operated at Wuhan University, uh, where I pupil competition in 2007. Ten years ago, I applied for graduate studies in Chinese uh, academic, academic sciences on competition, and then reaching Professor Hager in 2012. Uh, after that, but at Hawkins, I was able to touch upon various related disciplines. Uh, that's how I got in touch with Professor Tran and Professor Bidal. Uh, before I begin, I want to gently remind you that I use slide as a whiteboard. So as I proceed, uh, the slide may get busy. If you get lost, uh, skip it. Just keep up with me. We can come back uh, during the Q&A. For the reference done by others, for example, this series of papers, it will be shown in gray color and coded. For reference done by uh, myself in collaboration with my collaborators, it's shown as normal. Okay, I'd like to formally start my presentation talk now. The title is Image Set, Temporal and Spatial Temporal Representations of Videos for Recognizing, Localizing, and Quantifying Actions. But what does it mean? Basically, it means detecting and tracking face in a video, recognizing a face in a video. It can also mean detecting facial expressions in a video, recognizing a facial expression, detecting facial action units, assessing the facial action intensity and also the facial action units intensity. I just take face as an example. The same analogy can, can be adapted to human. So basically, uh, a tool to accomplish all this task is to have a good representation of the videos. We define the video representing learning as transforming the video into a, uh, another space where its essential structure is made, of, is made more visible or accessible for the task. The task can be those tasks listed in the, uh, in, in the slides. It can also be a uh, task for, for human uh, recognition. In one sentence, this dissertation tries to discuss how the structure of data and the requirements of certain tasks can help the radio representation learning process. So now, we can roughly categorize the video representation learning literature as um, four aspects, image data models, local temporal models, global temporal models, and spatial temporal models. Traditionally, an image set can be represented by the covariance matrix uh, of a future. So we treat these frames as a set of samples draw from certain distribution. It can also be modeled as the kernel divergence uh, on the Gaussian mixtures. So we use certain, um, draw a set of samples from Gaussian mixtures. So we treat uh, those frames just a bunch of samples. 
it can be also be modeling as the KL divergence on the Gaussian mixture. So we use the underlying distribution um, to represent the video instead of just using the samples. It can also be modeled as linear subspace uh, on, on a Grassmann, Grassmann manifold. For temporal models, one aspect is the local temporal models, such as simply computing frame difference or optic flow, feature and stereo matching, and estimating the motion for adjacent frame or in a local temporal window. And also like a dynam dynamic textures can be categorized into this, uh, this type. Basically we have one type is the threading and linking, the other type is more about tracking, migration, filtering for data association. The other aspect of, of temporal models is global temporal models. Typical examples are temporal pooling, hidden map models, temporal convolution networks, and the long short term memory networks. Many of those models are test of time, Motune, widely used, and well known. So I want to elaborate on them, but this is still an area where a lot of researches are still going on. For these models, the temporal window size is relatively large, uh, not just the neighboring frames. The same perspective can be applied to the spatial temporal models. A local, a global spatial temporal model is hard to model, it's hard, hard to build. Instead, frames can be sampled from a relative, relatively large uh, temporal window. For example, it is infeasible to directly train a 3D convolution network with inputs of the full video, easily consisting of hundreds or thousands of frames. At least right now, the status quo is still uh, not feasible. But this can be easily adapt addressed by sampling the videos or selecting the key frames. You can come in. There's extra chair. Yeah. At least right now, the status quo is not possible. But but this um, is still doable in, in, in the sense of video sampling and the key frame selection. Another, another type of uh, 3D spatial temporal model is the volumetric modeling. Basically, we treat a video as a pixel graph. In, in this case, uh, it's even impossible to model the full video as a giant graph. The status quo is still to work locally, both in space and time. Also notice that recently there's something called a structured uh, recurrent neural network. Basically, uh, they are getting more and more attention now, nowadays. For example, structured RNN. The graph is not necessarily the pixel graph the, edge, the nodes can be the objects in the scene, and the edges can be the object object interaction. By following these general approaches, uh, in this dissertation, we have examined the image set models, temporal models, and spatial temporal models. We're going to elaborate one by one uh, in this talk. This dissertation contributes in proposing uh, a set of video representation learning models to localize, segment, recognize, and assess actions, such as image set models by aggregating subset features, uh, given by regularizing normalized CNN. Image set models by in the frame principle recovery and sparsely coding uh, the residual actions. And also temporal motion models estimated by action detection with motion model added. And lastly, spatial temporal models with actions segmented by 3D graph class and quantified using uh, 3D CNN. We don't have a good sense of uh, what this means, but through this talk, I'm gonna elaborate on every item of this, uh, this set of contribution. Here's the agenda. First, we will look at image set representation of face video uh, as a set of deep features or by interframe modeling. Then I will talk about the temporal representation of egocentric videos by modeling the motion. After that, I will show how modeling a video as a pixel graph, 3D graph, can give a spatial temporal representation. In the end, I will draw some conclusion. Now let me begin with a set of deep features. Now the task is to learn a compact representation given a video. As there are redundant images, it becomes a subset selection problem. The similar images are similar on the head poses. So let's plot the rotation angles in the 3D space. The poses overlap, as you can see. Basically, we can treat it as either two clusters or three clusters for these uh, 200 frame videos, face videos. Can we just select 
only one from each cluster? Probably yes. As the rotation kind of rotation angle changes only when the heat pulse changes, uh, so it should be feasible. But which one to choose from? Probably the one closest to the same choice. In terms of practical significance, uh, we developed the pulse chemist layer uh, in CAFE back in 2016. It is the first publicly available working code of its kind in 2016. Here are example keyframes chosen to verify uh, to if two basic videos connect to the same person or not. Then we can compute two subsets distance, the distance between two subsets. One set of keyframes, the other set of keyframes, and compute the distance between two sets. However, are these futures comparable? That's a good question. Futures need to be normalized before taking in the product. As shown in the pipeline, at the training, we need to normalize the futures. At testing, we need to normalize both the futures and the weights. Future normalization is critical uh, for phase verification. I'm not sure if you can see this clearly. I think there's a strong light from this side. So basically, you can get uh, still get some performance boost mm -hmm. after normalization. So uh, this is still significant. As the performance on the label phase in the Y data set, LFW, has already been close to saturation. So even 1% of it will be great. Uh, this is the first normalization layer specialized for normalizing both the futures and the weights. There are the other papers which is either doing the only normalizing the weights or only normalizing the futures. And we published this paper, which is uh, both normalizing the futures and the weights. But here's an analysis. Why is normalization so effective? Intuitively, norm is related with recognizability for faces. A higher L2 norm means a high energy of the matrix and thus a clear image. Normalizing future with inner product as the metric is equivalent with normalizing uh, the cosine similarity. Basically, in a traditional uh, pipeline, people don't do future normalization and still use the inner product. We claim that's a bad. That's bad. If you don't normalize the future, you should you should use the cosine similarity. If you choose to do future normalization, then inner product uh, inner product is fine to use. We perform a toy experiment on the MNIST data set and project the futures into 2D space. This basically is eight layer CNN. Uh, it's, it's a toy network, and, run, and we run it on this toy experiment, uh, toy data set. Basically, as you can see, we want to, uh, it's a kind of example for inner product. Basically, we want to maximize the inner product. Here, once again, I'm not sure if you can uh, see it clearly, but F1 and F2 belong to a different class but their inner product is large. F2 and F3 belong to the same class, but their inner, inner product is small. So that's bad. Here's another uh, kind of example for the Euclidean distance. Basically, once again, we want to minimize the Euclidean distance. But in this case, F1 and F2 belong to a different class, but their Euclidean distance is small. Basically, I guess this is for class 5. F2 is for, uh, it's a sample from from uh, from class three, F1, F2 has a very close, are very close. They has a very small Euclidean distance, but they belong to different class. Instead, F2 and F3 belong to the same class, but their Euclidean distance is large. As a result, we think angle is a good similarity similarity metric for phase verification. So, if we use the unnormalized future, we should optimize the cosine. We propose a proposition giving the soft max loss bound uh, after normalization. The corresponding paper has gotten uh, 20 citations uh, within a year. By the way, why are the futures distributed in this Poisson shape? We plot the last layer, soft max probability for class two. As you can see, the yellow region is predicted all as class two. Visually, that's the reason why it's in, in the radial distribution. Intuitively, the softmax uh, function is the soft portion of max. You may not agree with me, but if I plot it, the softmax, max, uh, the, soft, the blue curve is the softmax function, and the max function is showing the red curve. Basically, the softmax function is trying to approximate uh, the max function, but it smooths all the way. 
and the fmax function is scale invariant. Therefore, scaling the future magnitude does not necessarily affect the assignment of the class under the softmax loss. In other words, the softmax loss encourages well separated futures to have a bigger magnitude. Scale invariance is the real reason. Sorry. Scale invariance is the real reason why this set of futures, when they're plotted in the 2D space, are distributed in a radial manner. We also propose, we also prove a proposition that the softmax loss uh, is scale invariant. It, it turns out when we explain this, it's uh, kind of straightforward, but it's, it is the first time to prove that softmax loss is scale invariant. If we have sli a slightly different task, where the input might be the same, we need to learn a different projection, a different representation, by fine-tuning the purpose representation. The significance of the following model, just to highlight, uh, bear with me, stay with me, the significance of the following, following model is that it verifies that by tuning from a data intensive per train domain can alleviate the problems a problem of small training, training set in other domains. Now, the, the label of uh, this video is not the expression category, but the expression intensity. Basically, this is show for the uh, specific expression category, uh, which is pain. It's show for the pain intensity. X is a frame, while Y is the pain intensity. We can modify the software loss in your um, means where error loss, but it suffers from the gradient exploding problem caused by the large magnitude of the gradient at the initial iterations. Actually, this is widely, uh, widely known. Sorry. Um, we can modify the software loss in the mean square error loss, just to repeat, but it suffers from the gradient exploding problem caused by the large magnitude of the gradient at the initial iteration. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. When you take the gradient, Basically, you still have this term, and along with the iterations, through it, this term will, will, will grow in up. That, that basically is what is called a uh, gradient exploding. So we need to choose a new loss. We choose to use the, uh, something called a smooth A1 loss. If you are familiar with the literature, basically it's the Hoover loss line. Uh, you can treat it as a com compromise between A1 loss and L L1, L1 norm loss and L2 norm loss. Basically, the L2 norm loss is the uh, uh, mean Square error loss, the L1 norm loss is the mean absolute error loss. If we take a gradient, this smooth L1 loss is uh, has constant gradient outside of negative one and and the zero one. But you may claim uh, mean absolute error loss, the L1 norm loss also has this property, but it's non differentiable at zero point. But for this uh, smooth L1 loss, it's smooth all the way. However, regressing values outputs pain levels such as 2.3, 2.35. So we add in regularization term after the regression loss to make the value somehow discrete. How can I explain what do I mean uh, by discrete? Yes, in the values uh, by conversation is always discrete, but, but we want to basically we want to pay values 2, 3, 4, not 2.5, 2.35. Uh, that term is the signal loss which minimizes the within-class distance, basically like in uh, LDA. Taking MNIS as an example again. again. Now, we, once again, we plot the future uh, in the two-dimensional space after the projection. The signal loss induced different from the radio distribution. Now, once you enforce the signal loss, this is the case uh, when only signal loss uh, is enforced. But in our case, we have both terms. We have the regularization. It has this kind of concentrated future distribution, just like a linear discriminative analysis. As a result, the regression loss makes the value spread out all over the axis. That's the regression loss. You get 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. .2 but the signal loss kind of balances that. It tries to push adjacent values to be as close as possible. It somehow serves, in, serves as a clustering uh, functionality. We test this model in the public on the public uh, shoulder pain data set. This is a public data set as we don't this is a challenging data set as we don't know when the pain expresses. Fortunately, 91% of the frames are labeled as no pain. 
the corresponding paper has roughly got uh, over 10 citations within a year. We need to, now we need to evaluate how similar the predicted curve is with, uh, is with the ground truth curve. This model performs the best under the mean, mean absolute error loss uh, measure, mean absolute error measure. That's measuring how, uh, how similar two curve, the ground truth curve and the prediction curve. Under the mean square error measure, uh, it still performs the best. Under Pearson correlation, uh, it's equally the best. However, there's an interesting observation. Uh, without doing anything, you just predict all zero. Give me a special plane radio, I just say every plane is k level zero. You can still get a reasonably good performance. So that's weird. Uh, that may mean the evaluation measure is problematic. We should wait each pain value by the population ratio of that value. Then it performs the best under all measures, Sim similar, uh, similarly predicting all zeros. A pretty large MAE, huge MSE, no longer yes, good performance. In summary, uh, in this section, we, we developed the first heat pulse based k means layer for deep face nets. It's generally we push it in GitHub, and a lot of people has already uh, forked it to use. We also developed the, the first layer specialized in normalizing futures as well as ways to boost the performance deep phase verification. Uh, this has been forked in GitHub for over 300 times. Moreover, we proved that softmax loss, softmax loss bound after the normalization. We don't just use it, we prove a bound that once you have the normalization, the softmax uh, loss can be reduced in a certain, in a certain ratio as well as for proof that the softmax loss is scale invariant, if you remember the example I gave. The proposed pain regressor becomes the first time to apply the regularizing loss idea to the pain assessment domain. It pushes the pain assessment performance by a large margin, and also, uh, interestingly, a new uh, weighted metric is proposed to, to address the unbalanced data unbalanced uh, issue. I hope the follow, people following this data set is gonna use the adopt the, gonna adopt the new metric. Till now, we have uh, explored Brian's deep image set representation for face videos, but there is no modeling across time. Now we will take a look how to model the image set across frames. Now we revisit the facial expression problems again. There are six expression categories. Sometimes there are uh, there is another expression category which, which is called a content, which is not shown here. Uh, a lot of existing researchers choose to rule it out because it confused with sadness. Basically, content is very close with uh, sadness. And by putting the all the sadness um, category samples into the uh, in all the content samples into sadness samples, however, we choose to keep it. Uh, for the completeness. Basically, the problem gets more challenge. And later we're gonna see, we have, a, we have a specific treatment to distinguish sadness and against the uh, uh, contempt. Notice that the expression expressive phase can be separated into a neutral phase and then expression residual. The, re the residual captures the muscle movements, which is called uh, action, facial action unit, it looks very much like eigenphase. Similarly, with the same impression, a person's face residual can be a linear combination uh, of other people's residuals. If we represent each frame as a vector, that's input y is the input frame, in, uh, input video, if we represent each frame as a vector, we can arrange them as a matrix y. Similarly, sorry, similarly, their corresponding Neutral phase forms another matrix L. However, this L matrix has a special property. As they have all the same neutral phase, right? It's the same video sequence, so it should have the same neutral phase. Ideally, L should be rank one. But due to noises, um, L can hardly be rank one. But we still want it to be as small as possible, so we want to minimize the rank. Moreover, the residual matrix can be written as a total, total product between the dictionary, or prepared dictionary D, and the coefficient matrix X. We arrange one expression categories after another. Basically, this might all be sadness, 
the second Chang'o blocks, Chang'o metrics may all be happiness. The training samples from the same categories are basically blessed together. As a result, D is over complete. And each coefficient vector in X should be sparse. Moreover, we do not just want X to be sparse. First, we want X to be as sparse as possible. One intuitive explanation is that is the Occam's razor, which tells us that among all solutions, you should choose the simplest solution. In our case, basically mean the sparsest solution. Um, the practical reason is that the sparsity also gives robustness. Second, as the as all the x, all the coefficient vectors in x belong to represent the same expression, as a result, they should be sparse in the same way. Namely, x should be group sparse. Basically, here we define group as a non-overlapping partition of all the frame indexes. As a result, we minimize the sparsity and, as well as the group sparsity of x and also the rank of, rank of L. The L1 norm is a good complex relaxation of sparsity. Namely, minimizing the L1 norm induces the sparsity solution under mild conditions. Moreover, exact recovery can be guaranteed by L1 minimization under suitable uh, conditions. The L1 norm for the matrix X basically is the entry-wise L1 norm, same as the L1 norm for vectors. The rank of matrix L basically uh, can be seen as the sparsity of the single of the singular values. So we can treat that as uh, minimizing the the rank basically is equivalent with minimizing minimizing the sparsity in the singular value space. And basically it's the L1 norm of the singular value vector. Here in, in this case, uh, L1 norm, the nuclear the nuclear norm this uh, L1 norm for matrix case uh, is also, for just for those who are, are not familiar with this, it's also called a nuclear norm. It's denoted as star. Minimizing the L1 norm induced sparsity, as we explained before, then which further gives the robustness? That's the reason why many low rank models are also called a robust PCA. F denotes the Frobenius norm, which basically means the element wise. Uh, L2 norm for that matrix is the same with the L2 norm for, for a vector. Minimizing over two, basically we have X and L. Minimizing over two variables, uh, basically it's not triple, but we can use the alternative minimization, a method called ADMM, to solve it. Basically fix one optimize over the other to, to, uh, to generate a, an updated another solution and then fix the other and optimize this one optimize over this one. We can elaborate on this um, ADM process later on during the QA. Now we test the proposed model on the CMU CK plus data set, which is a benchmark for facial expression recognition. It performs the best among sparse coding method. This is the performance uh, over 80%. And among all the sparse coding methods, it's the best. And not too far away from the recent uh, CNN based method. And even last year, the GAN based method um, basically makes the data set uh, gets to saturation again. That's the same analogy everywhere. Once deep learning is introduced or to a certain traditional data set benchmark, then the performance is going to be satur saturation. But uh, we are still not too far away from that. And among all the smart coding methods, performs the best. Here is an uh, example of result. The first row shows the test improved. The second row uh, shows the recovered low rank metric, recovered neutral phase. Third row shows the recovered facial, recovered facial expression residual. And the uh, fourth row shows the uh, error. Uh, indeed, error is group sparse. I guess you cannot see it. Uh, it's group sparse, but trust me, it's group sparse. Uh, here you can see from another example. Basically, now we we try to. Uh, try to distinguish contempt against sadness. Once we enforce the group sparsity, it predicts correctly, and then the enforcing uh, matrix, coefficient vector, coefficient matrix X is indeed group sparse. If we don't have group sparsity enforced, in this case, it predicts sad, 
uh, which is incorrect, incorrect. Although the recovered X is fast, there's no group group structure in the uh, in, in the coefficient matrix X. If you if you understand what does this coefficient coefficient matrix mean, you don't have group sparsity, then basically means the support is active, active, activated everywhere. Some for happiness, some for sadness, some for angry, so it's hard to tell. But if, if you have group sparsity, I believe this is all corresponding, it's all corresponding to the uh, contempt, contempt uh, samples in the dictionary. In summary, as expression is a mixture of action units, the re this set of results gives hopes of, of approximating a nonlinear facial expression using piecewise linear models. You can fix certain variable in the pose, in the expression, or the identity fixing some terms and minimizing over the other. Then you can, you can get a piecewise linear model. Here now we have proposed the price in the set of models, but the inner frame modeling does not necessarily mean uh, temporal modeling. A local cue of temporal dynamics is motion. The, glo the spatial global motion can be estimated using a uh, robot's future matching. The local, um, the spatial local motion, here we basically mean uh, the moving objects in the scene uh, can be modeled uh, by detection and tracking. We call, now the task is not just to recognize, but also localize the action. We call the online boosting based tracking method, which is shown in the top figure uh, for tracking of face. It's appearance based and does suffer from the drifting problem. When the tracking result is inaccurate, then the chosen updated samples, positive samples will be also inaccurate. As a result, the induced uh, updated classifier is gonna be less and less discriminative. This is also called a drifting uh, in, in, the, in the context of, of tracking. 